again. The passage today is in Matthew chapter 24. If you have your Bibles, you can open up there. Thank you, Lord, for today, bringing us all here. And Lord, for those that aren't with us this morning, please be with them. Bless them and keep them until we're gathered together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, all right. So I started my life, my professional life, you know, working uh, in pro professional stuff as an accounting assistant. That was my title. Covered all aspects of accounting. That's what I had gone to school for. Uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, payroll, everything. It took me five years to realize that I didn't like the repetitiveness of accounting. <laughs> I'm a slow learner sometimes. Week after week, month after month, it was the same old thing. Enter transactions, reconcile accounts, pay the bills, close the books at the end of the month, and then start all over. Month after monotonous month, it was the same old thing. Thing. And so I left there, I didn't, uh, went and taught Taekwondo for a year, bought fires for four summers before becoming a police officer for 14 years, and then I became a pastor. And you know what pastoring is like? Every seven days, Sunday in church. Second Sunday of every month, communion. Every spring is Easter, every winter is Christmas, it's back to repetition. But I like this repetition a lot better. There's a lot uh, much betterness to it. <laughs> we can't predict where we'll end up. I had never thought back then that I'd be here now. Nor can we predict the paths that we will take to get there. It would be nice to know though, wouldn't it? Like, here's where you're going. Here's how to get there. Wouldn't you love those of us that, that have more birthdays than others to go back to your 18 year old self and say, hey, this is what's gonna happen. This is what you need to do to prepare for it. This is how it's gonna end up getting there. Give that 18 year old advice. Of course, I remember the 18 year old me and I would not have listened, but still would be nice to know. If I had known then what I know now, what I know now, everything would be different. I would have taken different action. I would have been more prepared. I'm sure lives would be changed if I had known then what I know now. I imagine everyone here has at least one day or moment in life when they could make the same statements if I had only known. Well, we cannot go back in time and it's a futile exercise to ponder the if only. The if onlys and how those might change, but we can't change them. So there's no point in it. But what we can do is take what knowledge we have and apply it to our future. That's the definition of wisdom, by the way, is applying knowledge to life. Knowledge is great. They say knowledge is power, but if you have all the knowledge in the world and you don't use it, it's not very good. Using it, that is wisdom. Now the disciples in this passage that we'll look at today, they wanted to be wise. They wanted to apply the things that Jesus had said and done to their future, right? They're living, they're, they were living lives that had been changed by encountering Jesus, by following Jesus. They were no longer doing what they were doing before, doing new things. But they expected also, hey, there's more to come. There's got to be more than just this wandering around teaching and doing miracles. And they had their own thoughts of what that would be, but they had an incomplete understanding of God's plan. And so they asked Jesus, what's going to come? What's to come? What do we expect? And his answer was they should expect the unknown and the unexpected. Because no one knows the future, they needed to be prepared and vigilant. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but I've been adding the Christian calendar to the bulletin. Last Sunday was the last Sunday of end time, the end of the Christian year, so to speak. And today is the first Sunday of the Christian year, also known as Advent. This is the season of preparing for Jesus. Probably uh, several of you grew up celebrating, knowing about Advent. I did not, not even in my uh, previous Baptist church did we really talk about or celebrate Advent. We just didn't follow the Christian calendar. But a lot of churches, in fact, uh, many denominations do this. So this Advent season is a season of preparing for Jesus. It's not just, hey, you've got four weeks left until Christmas. It's, it's preparing 
for Jesus. We look back at his birth at Christmas, certainly that's the first time the Son of God came to earth, but we also look forward to his return or his second coming. And as we go into this season, we'll follow the lectionary passages and see how they lead us through Advent in a time of preparing for Jesus. The lectionary again is uh, mainline denominations. This is actually from the Lutheran uh, lectionary. They have a three-year calendar of readings, Old Testament, New Testament, Gospels, Psalms, uh, that take you pretty much through the whole Bible over three years, and that's the lectionary each week is different passages. So today's passage is in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 42. Now, Jesus and uh, the disciples, they had just been in the temple, and they were walking out. Jesus had just pronounced woes on the religious leaders. Woe to you, Pharisees. Woe to you, Sadducees. And then lamented over Jerusalem. Like, Jerusalem, you know, if only you would repent. I would gather you together. But instead, bad things are going to happen. And Jerusalem was not just that city, but representative of the whole nation of Israel. And so as they're leaving, the disciples are probably confused, maybe a little frightened. And uh, they sought some assurance, some stability. They were looking like, wow, this is not a very pretty picture that you just painted there, Lord. You know, let's, let's look for some stability. You talk about destruction and things. And, and so they point out this magnificent temple, and it really was a magnificent temple. Large stones, beautiful architecture. Look at this temple, Lord, they say. And he says, it's all coming down. Now they're really upset and confused. And they go to the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. And he told them of a coming time of tribulation. Now when he's talking about that, he's referring to Rome's putting down a revolt in Judea, the region around Jerusalem. And the destruction of the temple was going to happen in the year 7070, the year of our Lord. Wondering when this was going to happen, because he didn't say... You know, hey, in like 35 years, 36, whatever, how many years uh, from now, this whole, this is what's going to happen. He just said, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be bad. The temple's going to be destroyed. And they're like, when? When is this going to happen? When will this be, Jesus? They asked. So picking up in verse 36, we see the answer. Jesus tells them. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware till the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Lord Jesus, may it be so. May you come soon. May we be ready for it. Thank you for these words of warning, these words of preparation. During this season of preparation. Help us to understand, help us to be ready, we pray in your name. Amen. Jesus tells the disciples, stay awake, which is another way of saying, be vigilant. Be vigilant. In fact, the Greek word, Gregoryuo, common spelling, it's translated as stay awake here, uh, but it also means watch, give strict attention to, be cautious, take heed, lest some destructive calamity suddenly overtake one. <coughs> yes, the Greek language is very efficient. Stay awake is expressed as an imperative, which means a command. Jesus tells his disciples, including us today, be vigilant, because we can't, we won't, we don't know when he is coming back. Now, we don't want to fall into the accountant-like routine of mundane day-to-day -day activity, be lulled to sleep waiting for Christ to return. The consequences can be disastrous. Just ask the people of Noah's day. Oh wait, we can't. There all gone, washed away in the flood. Look at verse 37, where he says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then he describes in verse 38, Before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, 
until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I don't think they were unaware, unaware, like, oh, gee, surprise, all of a sudden, here's all this water. I mean, it took Noah some time to build the ark. The ark was huge. Maybe 70 years, according to the Ark Encounter website, maybe less. He probably had people helping him. It wasn't just him and his sons, more than likely. It's not a backyard project. I had a, uh, one of the elders in my previous church was building a sailboat in his backyard. And, you know, seemingly secret, but I mean, at some point the mask goes up and people are like, hey, there's a boat in your backyard, <laughs> right? Not so with Noah. This is like out in the open. This thing is like over 500 feet long, over 50 feet high, 85 feet wide. It's pretty massive and easily seen by the people around Noah at the time of the building. I'm sure they asked, hey, what are you doing? Why are you building this? I'm sure he told them, God told me to build it because there's going to be a flood. <sighs> yeah, right. Come on, let's go party. The point is they knew it was coming and they ignored it. They kept about their busy little lives, eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, right until Noah boarded the ark and the door closed. And then the rain started and everyone was like, uh-oh. They were not vigilant. <coughs> it gets scary actually thinking about that. The sound of the people pounding on the ark. Let us in, let us in. Uh, Christ's second coming will be like the day Noah boarded the ark. So the suddenness of his return requires vigilance. And he describes that in verses 40, 41 and 42. Two men will be in the field, one taken and one left. Two women grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Now, you know, there's different uh, theories because he's not entirely clear, certainly that can be uh, construed as evidence for the rapture. The believers are taken because he says he appears in the heavens and gathers his people to him. Two men in the field, one's a believer, he's taken and one's left behind. Two women, one's a believer, she's taken. Therefore stay awake, you do not know what day the Lord is coming. You see in his description the suddenness, there they are working in the field, boom, gone. We are to be vigilant, always watching for Jesus. Now, I'm not suggesting that we pour over scriptures and look for clues to find out when, because you can't, you won't, and you don't know. Only the Father knows. I'm not saying look at current affairs and see signs of the tribulation and proclaim the end is near. The end is nearer every day. It's nearer today than it was yesterday. Certainly things are bad, but things are worse have been worse in the past. If you look around and believe that we're going through some trying times, you're right. Absolutely, we are. If you believe Jesus can return any day now, you're right. Absolutely, he can. If these beliefs cause you to want to do something about it, like tell people or draw closer to God yourself, you're right. You should do both. Being vigilant is about mindset. It's about having a watchful attitude about Christ's return. It is the opposite of the people left banging on the side of the ark. As water rapidly rose and the rain poured down, they ignored the signs that something was up. They dismissed Noah's activity as something a crazy person was doing and did not see it as the coming judgment of God. Be vigilant. Wake up every morning and say, today could be my last day on earth and my first day in heaven. Jesus could return and take me home today. Know the truth of that because it is true. Jesus will return and take his church home with him. He said he would, and he has never lied. Believe him and be vigilant, watching for his return, but live like you'll be here another 70 years while the ark is built. Being vigilant is about right beliefs and attitudes regarding the advent of Jesus. He came, he lived, he died, he was raised from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he will return Again, vigilance is important, but so is preparedness. We are to be prepared and vigilant. And so Jesus tells us this, be prepared. Matthew 24, 43 and 44. But know this, 
the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have left, let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So, if you know something is going to happen, you get ready for it, right? Even if it's five minutes beforehand, you get ready for it. There's an art. That's a, that's a spiritual gift, by the way. Being able to get ready five minutes before something happens. At least I think it is, maybe. <laughs> it's just me. That's Jesus' point in verse 43. Be prepared. Get ready. Prepared for what, though? Well, the disciples were asking about the sign of Jesus' coming and the signs of the end of the age. That's in verse 3 of Matthew. That's exactly what they ask in verse 3 of Matthew 24. He told them what was going to happen and what it would be like, and then said, but you won't know when, so be vigilant, and now be prepared. If the homeowner knew, he would have been prepared. If the homeowner, any homeowner, knew their house was going to be a thief's target, then they would stay awake and stop the thief before he steals anything. They might even prepare some elaborate trap for the thief, or they may just wait and scare the thief off. Whatever the plan, the point is, they would be prepared for when it happens. That's the physical analogy. But we're talking about spiritual preparedness. He says, you don't know when Christ is coming, so be prepared. You must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. When Jesus returns, it'll be too late to do anything. He's here, surprise. Not really a surprise, because he said it could be any time that he would appear. Read the whole of chapter 24 this week if you get a chance. Jesus said there's going to be a lot of things happening. A lot of talk about his return. A lot of trouble. A lot of gospel being preached. It will all seem so bad, it will seem like things can't get any worse. So you think that the end is near. And then the sky goes dark, the heavens are shaken, Christ appears in the heavens and calls his people home. But you can't, you don't, and you won't know when, so be prepared. Get right with God before this happens. That's what being prepared means. Jesus' first coming was for salvation. <laughs> Jesus' first coming was for salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's John 3.16. And then Paul tells us, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's in Romans chapter 10. Believe and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is the preparation. Believe you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe that Jesus is that Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. And Peter said in Acts 4, 12, there is no other name by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way to be saved. So right now, we're in this liminal space. That's one of the great words that I learned uh, in pastoring. It's the space between. We're in this liminal space between Jesus' first coming, when he came to save the world, and his second coming when he will return to judge the world. But until he does, we need to be prepared and vigilant, ready and waiting for his return. You can take action today by asking for forgiveness of your sins and receiving salvation through Jesus Christ. Following Jesus is as simple as believing in him. But I caution you, as you many well know, that following him is not always easy. It's simple, but not easy. In four weeks, we celebrate the birth of Christ, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Today is Advent, the start of the Christian calendar. Advent means coming, so we look back at the incarnation, the first coming of Christ, but we also look forward to the parousia, or second coming of Christ. Today we saw Jesus commands us be prepared and vigilant for his return. He came, he lived, he died for your sins in your place on the cross, he was raised for the dead, from the dead, he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father, waiting to return. And when he does, will you be prepared and vigilant? No one knows the day or the hour that Christ will return. So while we wait, we need to be prepared. Like Noah, who built the ark, 
the homeowner who stayed awake for the coming thieves. Prepared and vigilant means having a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and being engaged in doing kingdom work so that when he returns, we are found to be good and faithful servants. The alternative is to be knocking on the side of the ark as the water rises up your legs or coming home to find your house emptied by a thief. You may also find your family gone, taken up with Christ and leaving you behind. If you had only known, that would not happen. Well, now you do know. So I invite you to prepare your soul for eternity by following Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we look around the world and see many of the things that you described in this passage and in others. Certainly there's troubles. Certainly there's evil in the world. Certainly we are not perfect. We are sinners in need of a savior. Because we're not perfect, because we are sinners, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And so, Father, you sent your son Jesus to live a perfect sinless life and die in our place on the cross for our sins. And to prove to us that sins are forgiven, that the sacrifice that Jesus made was acceptable, you raised him from the dead on the third day. Now, if we turn from our sins, and indeed that's an ongoing thing, but we do need to recognize that we are sinners and turn from that and turn towards you and accept this offer of salvation that you give us through Jesus. And to realize that on the cross he paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. We just need to keep leaning on him, keep following him, keep relying on him. And so I pray that we do that, Lord. Pray that we say, Jesus, I am a sinner and thank you for paying for my sins on the cross. I want to follow you all the days of my life until you call me home when you return or maybe before that, we don't know. So help us to be prepared and vigilant as we await your return. We ask in your holy name, amen.